Now that we've discussed the difference between one-way behavior and two-way behavior, uh, looked at the reasons that we always want to increase slab efficiency by trying to spread the load paths out uh, in as many directions as we can, um, we'll look at how we do this in a variety of materials, mostly timber and concrete, uh, but we'll also look at some hybrid uh, steel solutions as well. Um, and we'll look at the way that we design uh, each of these types. And the, the good news is that instead of a lot of complicated math, we have a long, long history of empirical evidence that uh, gives us um, the, the confidence to use some uh, very uh, basic rule of thumb tables to calculate most, uh, most floor thicknesses. Um, in general, what we're trying to do with uh, concrete slabs in particular is to find ways to get this two-way behavior, right? to, to make slabs uh, have load paths that are multiple and hyperstatic, um, and at the same time to look out for punching shear, to design connections basically between slabs and columns that involve increasing the cross-sectional area of a, a column and slabs kind of intersection. So either a, a cylinder, if it's a round uh, column, uh, or a hollow square if it's a, if it's a square column. And we do this often by kind of replicating uh, joists and beam and girder arrangements that we're used to seeing in steel. So uh, we have uh, one-way uh, spanning systems where you can think of these either as reinforcing a very, very thin slab with a set of concrete beams. Here we have one-way concrete joists so there's a span in a single direction, right? One longitudinal direction. Um, but notice that because the joists are monolithic with the slab, uh, when one of those joists deflects, it's gonna pull down the slab and all of those other joists are gonna have to deflect as well. So even though we call them one-way joists, we're really getting a little bit of two-way behavior out of that. One-way slab we already talked about. Um, here we're limited usually in the, the uh, distance we can span. Um, we try to keep these relatively short. We try to keep the proportions relatively long this way. Um, but we sometimes do this. And with a flat slab, uh, again, the problem is that we're trying to prevent the columns from like punching right through it. Uh, so in this case, the one-way slab frames into basically very deep portions of the slab or, or beams. They're beams, but they're integral with the slab. Uh, and we're relying on the depth of those beams to offer some shear resistance when that load finally gets to the, to the column. We can turn that perpendicular to itself. A two-way slab with beams is super efficient. We have a, a, a thin slab here that's spanning uh, in multiple directions. We have two uh, directional beams at every column. And we're relying on, again, the depth of the beam and the, the perimeter or the, the perimeter of the column uh, to take the very heavy shear load of that heavy slab. Um, timber, we're not always so worried. and timber, we're usually worried more about deflection. Um, we will still try to get two-way behavior. So decks that span in the short direction here, joists that span in the long direction, uh, and then beams that, in this case, are probably spanning uh, maybe the same way as the, the, um, the deck. We'll take a look at a few variants of that. Uh, and then um, some extreme ones. So a waffle slab which is basically a one-way concrete joist system set perpendicular to itself. And you can imagine the efficiencies there. We have a, a hyperstatic two-way system, so we can span a great distance. Uh, the problem we run into is that waffle slabs tend to be pretty heavy. There's a lot of concrete there that, that we're dealing with. Um, two-way flat slabs, where instead of uh, dropping beams, we drop what are called column caps, basically thickening the slab around the column, or you can flip it around and think about these column caps as giant expansions of the column, but only in the vicinity of the, of the slab. And here we're allowed to take the shear of that perimeter area uh, and use all of that uh, to, to resist punching shear. And finally, true flat plates, where we're just loading up the, the junction between the column and the slab with so much steel that the steel ends up taking uh, most of the shear. So architecturally quite clean, uh, construction-wise quite uh, expensive, right? Quite a challenge. Um, and we're, we're going to be talking about uh, these two terms, uh, anisotropic and isotropic. Um, isotropic slabs are basically uh, slabs that span in every direction at once. Uh, 
So totally flat slabs that maybe have column caps or something, but, but that are more than two-way, where the, the uh, loads are actually following an infinite number of load paths. The other condition is what we call anisotropic. So a purely one-way slab um, only carries loads in, in, in one direction. And there's no truly anisotropic slab. Every concrete slab is going to um, have a little bit of two-way action. But when we get uh, above that kind of 1.5 to 1 ratio, we find that we're basically treating those as anisotropic, right? Slabs that have a very, very strong structural grain and are much stronger uh, in one direction than in another. This is also the case with uh, timber. If we take just a piece of uh, flat timber, it has a very, very strong structural grain. It's strong along the grain, very, very weak across the grain. And we have to think about the way that the, the wood behaves uh, in those two directions. A principle we'll see a number of times is this layering up of spanning directions. So since wood is anisotropic, when we are laying up a, a floor deck, what we're going to see is that we're putting the strong direction of the grain in multiple directions in multiple layers. And if you think about this, if you've seen particularly old floors where they used uh, diagonal planks and then uh, straight uh, floorboards, this will look very familiar, right? Trying to get as many directions out of uh, a, a directional material uh, as we can. The more of these we layer up, the more directions floor loads will span and the more efficient the system will be. So when we're looking at uh, timber construction, and these days mass timber construction in particular, you can see that here we have uh, floorboards that are spanning along a diagonal. Um, there may actually be another layer of boards that probably take one of the, the building uh, directions uh, as, as, their, um, as their grain. And of course, we're laying that out so the long grain is parallel to the direction of the board. So these boards are spanning diagonally and they're spanning with the grain. So that is the strong direction. They are framing into uh, beams and girders. And of course, the beams and girders are going in two different directions as well. So that by the time all of that load gets to the column, we've, we have a slab that has a couple of directions and that's relying on both the, uh, the floorboards, the beams, and the girders all to resist deflection monolithically. And they'll be nailed tight uh, to those uh, joists and to those uh, beams and girders so that the, the whole floor system has these kind of three directions, right? The direction of the girders, direction of the joists, direction of the floorboards. And notice too what happens when the timber elements come together. Timber, remember, doesn't have a whole lot of shear capacity. And so what we have to do when we're taking a big floor load and putting it either into a relatively skinny beam or into a really narrow column, is we have to switch materials. We have to use something like steel that can handle the very, very high shear stresses that are gonna build up when we take maybe 30 feet by 30 feet of dead load uh, in the timber, live load people and safes and sandwiches and things on the top and try to funnel all of that into one column. So this is our first example of a, of a shear connection. And you can see that that is typically done uh, throughout, right? That whenever we're transferring loads from one heavily loaded timber piece to another, we end up having to switch materials uh, to take care of the, of the very heavy shear loads involved. Now, so here's our first uh, table, um, and we'll look at a bunch of these, and these are, are really simple. There's usually span across the bottom uh, and depth uh, up, uh, up, up the side. And what this is telling us basically is the safe depth of a given material or a given system for a given span. And here you can see that we, we get wood decking in uh, basically a handful of dimensions, so two inches, two and a half inches, four inches, etc. And you can see that there's a safe load in black for floors and a safe load in white for roof decks, right? Roof decks because we typically have uh, about half of the live load that we do uh, on floors. So depending on uh, how big our span is, um, if we have a five foot span, then a two inch deck is safe for a floor. A 10 foot span, uh, a two and a half, or a, a, yeah, sorry, a three inch, uh, deck just about enough, and you can see that as we go up, um, that decking gets much, much 
thicker, right, quickly. So decking we tend to do over fairly short spans, right? That's a, that should be familiar. Um, we we want to get these into joists or into beams as quickly as we can. And notice the detail here. Uh, wood decking typically has this key detail that I talked about so that when we push down on uh, one piece of deck, it pulls the other one down with it. And even though we refer to these as one-way systems, we're going to get a little bit of that two-way uh, behavior uh, through the, 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 the resistance to deflection. So we'll see um, a whole bunch of uh, these kind of charts. This is going to be the, the simplest, most basic one, and it's got the shortest spans to it, right? Um, solid pieces of wood, uh, we tend not to span very far. When we do, we start to run into serious depths uh, right away. We try to keep those wood deck usually down uh, in the two to four inch range. Now, those can sit on uh, wood floor joists. And here you can see that we have a similar arrangement span across the bottom, joist size uh, up the, up the left-hand side. And because joists are essentially beams, we get some fairly familiar ratios. So a sort of uh, span over 12 or span over 15, the, the kind of thing that we see typically uh, in beam design. A little bit on the efficient side because usually these are attached very firmly to the wood deck and therefore the deck, when one joist is uh, deflecting, that deck is gonna tend to pull the other joists with it. We're gonna get some uh, monolithic behavior out of the deck. So these are slightly more efficient shapes than if we were just designing uh, the, the joists as beams themselves. And you can see we have a list of strong woods versus normal woods. That's the difference between black and white here. And special variants for eye joists. In other words, where we're taking those uh, two by eights or two by tens and we're attaching basically wooden flanges uh, to either ends. And here you can see that we go from the, the kind of five or six feet up to maybe 16 or 18 feet spans for wood joists. And that from uh, residential wood frame construction, those are the kind of dimensions that, that we're typically used to. Now, we uh, employ similar principles when we do steel floor systems. And these are never purely steel. They're always what we call composite decks. Usually these are made up of steel beams, uh, steel joists, and then a corrugated metal deck that we put concrete fill into. Steel is, of course, a very strong material. It would be very good for a floor, uh, except that it is, we use it in very thin sheets, uh, which are not good either for fire or for acoustics. So a composite deck, we have a corrugated steel deck that we can attach very easily using uh, bolts and welds to open web joists, to uh, steel beams and girders. Um, we then come in and we put a layer usually between two and four inches of concrete uh, on top of that. Now, that corrugated deck is going to be basically a one-way system, right? Just like timber, a corrugated deck is going to be strong along the corrugations and very weak across it. Um, we're going to uh, put that usually on other one-way systems, typically open web steel joists. Uh, and then those steel joists are going to frame into girders that very often are going to take on the same directionality uh, as, the, um, as the steel deck. So notice we have one two directions, right? Uh, gr very, very strongly grained material in one direction, linear elements in the other direction, and finally linear elements uh, going back to the original direction. So layering these up, right, we're making basically, uh, or, or we're trying to make a two-way system out of one-way elements. And we're doing that by changing the orientation uh, in every layer. Uh, here may be a familiar uh, composite deck for you, and you can see open web steel joists, uh, composite deck, the concrete will be up on top of that, uh, and then those open web joists sit on these uh, W-shaped girders that are spanning uh, a good 35 or 40 feet. Now, you can see the advantage right away to this, that even though those open web joists and those girders are fairly deep, the steel system is kind of porous. We can put all sorts of sprinkler pipes, uh, electrical cables, sometimes uh, some larger ducts through that. So we have a deep system, but it's a porous system. This is one of the great advantages uh, of steel and floor framing is that even though we're taking up a lot of building section, we're taking it up with uh, materials that are largely air and that we can put stuff through uh, fairly easily. So here, a detail of the steel deck. 
Note the uh, little ridges here that make the steel deck into a, a strong folded plate. Um, total depth of the slab will usually fill up the deck and then add uh, an inch or two uh, on top of that. So we get a total of maybe um, uh, uh, anywhere from uh, two to six inches total depth of slab. And we will occasionally also weld uh, studs to the top and bottom of the deck to make sure that the concrete and the decking work monolithically. It's a way of turning the decking into a kind of default reinforcing for the, for the concrete deck. Very often there will also be some nominal reinforcing in here uh, just to provide a little bit of extra bending strength uh, and, and to resist a little bit some of the, uh, the cracking and shear that we might get with the deck otherwise. So here our steel floor decking notice that we've got relatively short spans, so we're always going joist to joist. Maximum spans of maybe 12 to 15 feet. And you can see here we have total depth of slab, so that's bottom of the deck to top of the slab, and that gets up to six or eight inches fairly quickly. Which when you think about it, that's still pretty good, right? A 12 foot span with a six inch uh, depth, that's a one to 24 ratio. So we're clearly getting some advantages out of the monolithic nature of the, of the, the concrete. Um, but again, relatively short spans, and as we get up beyond 12 feet, we start to get fairly deep uh, decks, and that ends up being a fairly heavy, uh, heavy floor system. The advantage if we keep the spans relatively small is that the overall system is much lighter. We're adding less dead load uh, to, the, to the overall structural system. Okay, moving into concrete. Um, we talked briefly about one-way pan joists and how these are efficient because even though we call them one-way, they're kind of visually or formally uh, one-way joists. Um, because they're monolithic, they're all bonded together uh, by, the, by, the, by the concrete slab. Um, they take advantage a little bit of this resistance to deflection that the entire system will have. We call them pan joists because they're literally formed around uh, removable metal pans. Um, these are typically leased out by a contractor. Um, they're form oiled up. The concrete is poured on top of them. They can be easily disarmed and, and recycled many, many times. Uh, here you see they're put usually on a plywood deck, and the plywood deck is supported from the floor below uh, by these uh, temporary posts down here. So here the joists are spanning this way. The, the voids are where the pans uh, were on the formwork deck. So again, concrete formworks like baking muffins, right? What's negative in the pan is positive in the, in the muffin. Um, and our concrete muffin here, uh, where the pans join is where we get these drops, right? These are where the joists end up. Those joists span between uh, dropped beams. Here, just the thickness of the slab, but very often they'll drop below the slab a little bit. And that is to provide basically some girders that span between the columns and also to give us enough cross-section at the columns to prevent uh, punching shear. So the slab itself can be fairly thin. Um, the joists have to be fairly deep. The, the disadvantage of this over steel is one, it, it remains very heavy, and two, it's not particularly porous. We might be able to scooch some conduit up into those voids to, to take care of some lighting, but any ductwork, anything that's of any size at all is going to have to drop entirely below uh, the, the depth of the, of the concrete. So here's a pan joist going into place, uh, muffin tin, and here is the concrete muffin. Um, and you can see that can easily get reused again. The result is basically a, a, a slab here that's a few inches thick. We can make that as deep as we want. And then where the pan drops down, right, the sort of um, side of the pan and the brim uh, of the pan there, that forms uh, a, a joist. And we can control the width of that by how far apart we space the pans. Um, the depth of that is going to be determined by the amount of concrete slab that we put uh, above the pan itself. Very, very quick, easy way to make uh, a whole bunch of uh, concrete joists that are monolithic with the slab. Uh, in a hurry. Okay, so here is our uh, table for uh, site cast concrete one-way joists, and you can see these get, um, here's the span down here, the depth up here, uh, and these get pretty good uh, in a hurry, right? We can go uh, up to um, about 24 feet with a 20-inch deep uh, 
total depth, so that is slab plus joist, and uh, that gets us uh, well above the kind of um, one to one to twenty ratio that uh, that is the kind of top for beams. So even though one way joists, there is some two way action because of the, of the monolithic slab. And here you can see these are the depths of the pans. That ends up being the depth of the joist below the slab. And then over here, this is the total depth of the joist plus the deck on top. Right. So twelve inch pans with a four inch deck give us a sixteen inch total depth. Now, you'll see here we have a difference between conventional reinforcing and post-tensioning. Post-tensioning is the process where instead of just laying rebar in the bottom of the joists, we lay ducts and stainless steel tendons that can then get tightened up and provide this kind of super reinforcing uh, to, the, to the bottom of the slab. You can see that there's an awful lot of advantage to be gained there, right? We can, in some cases, uh, more than double the span that we're after uh, with post-tensioning. As you can imagine, that is an expensive process. Um, it requires, among other things, a structural engineer on site for the entire tensioning process, monitoring gauges and things. So we do this really only when we need to. Things like parking garages, stuff like that, um, is where we use post-tensioning. But as you can see, that super reinforcement uh, does do an awful lot to allowing these joists uh, to span much, much farther. Um, we can use a similar system with precast planks, where we're actually forming the slab and planks off-site, trucking them to the, uh, the job site, and then erecting them on uh, steel or port-in-place or even precast uh, beams and girders. So here we have precast planks on a precast girder, and these probably are precast columns as well. So basically uh, making a bunch of precast Lego blocks, putting them on trucks, uh, and shipping them to the site. That, of course, uh, is a tremendous advantage in terms of uh, time on the site, requires a much longer lead time uh, in terms of uh, planning uh, and material logistics. Now, these are true uh, one way. We can cast keys and slots into the sides of them uh, to provide a little bit of two-way action, um, but we are not going to be quite as efficient with this as we would if that slab were completely monolithic. Um, spans of 20 to 40 feet. And the weight is similar uh, to port-in-place concrete, but as we'll see, there are ways that, that we can reduce that. And then we can get a little bit more two-way action by pouring concrete uh, on top of this, right? By putting a topping slab uh, over the top of the planks to, to bond them together monolithically. Um, how can we uh, reduce weight? Well, we can take that solid plank and we can turn it into a pretty good approximation of a whole bunch of linked I-beams uh, by casting cylinders or pipes into the plank while it's in the precasting plant. Uh, usually we gain a little bit of depth by doing that or, or have to gain a little bit of depth, but as you can see, we're removing a lot of weight that is right around the neutral axis. And we're taking what had been our prototypical dumb beam, right, narrow and, or sorry, uh, shallow and wide, and we're making it a little bit smarter. We're making it feel like it is a bunch of interconnected concrete uh, I-beams. Similar process to uh, the steel deck where we're basically removing giant chunks of the slab by excluding it from the, from the base. Um, and we can also do an approximation of pan joists in precast by using what are called singular double T's where we're actually making a, a T-beam, in this case, T-beams that are uh, monolithically connected providing that, uh, that slab, that kind of dumb beam, with enough of a flange that we get, or enough of a web, that we get a, a much better section modulus, right? And then a much better uh, capacity for, uh, for bending. These are what hollow core slabs look like. Um, again, taking all that dead weight away, we can sometimes use that space for things like conduit. We'll probably never use it for uh, plumbing because there's no way really, no good way to access it. Um, but as you can imagine, this is a very, very uh, fast way uh, to build. If you've stayed in like a Motel 6 or a Hampton Inn, if you look at the ceiling, you'll see right away that um, uh, cheap hotel construction relies on uh, precast planks because it's so fast. These things can go up uh, really, really quickly. So here is our um, chart for uh, precast uh, solid and hollow core slabs. Solid flat slabs down here, hollow core slabs up here. 
Um, you see that if we add a topping slab, we gain a little bit in, in terms of span. And you can see that the um, span to depth ratios are still pretty good, especially with, with hollow core slabs. Um, that comes only with that keyed uh, detail uh, and certainly improved when we add a uh, topping slab to it, right? Make these things perform uh, in, uh, in, in concert with one another. Um, 20 feet is, is usually the, the kind of practical limit. We do uh, occasionally get longer slabs. Again, these are very often in things like parking garages where that span is a real necessity. Um, they are a little bit more difficult. We, they take a little bit more time uh, to get the hollows either drilled out of them uh, or, or cast in place. And you can see too that we're casting in place just a little bit of nominal rebar in the tensile area of the slab to, to make it behave like a reinforced concrete uh, beam. Uh, here in construction, um, if we uh, use hollow core, um, if we post tension these, we can get up to 100 feet. Bigger spans are heavier, uh, harder to move around on highways, uh, and require, of course, more uh, care on site. Um, but we, that 100 feet is often very useful. Uh, things like parking garages, high school gyms, things like that. Um, the span to weight ratio for double T's is very, very good. It's comparable not just to uh, hollow or not just to pan joists, but almost comparable to uh, to steel. Not quite, but but approaching it. So that means that we need less uh, columns, less beams, uh, less mass to support them, uh, and that trickles down into the foundations. Right, a, a lighter concrete structure. It's a lot of the advantages of concrete, uh, with some of the um, uh, time advantages and weight advantages of steel. As you can see, there are plenty of examples where the entire building, right, uh, slabs, beams, columns, even exterior walls, uh, can all be made offline in the, the precasting plant and just literally assembled uh, on site. Okay, so what about um, anisotropic systems where uh, we have, uh, or, sorry, um, uh, two-way anisotropic systems where we have a two-directional uh, structural grain? The simplest of these are what we call plate and beam. So these will have two-way action within each structural bay, um, but that's, uh, the, the, the bays will be defined by edge beams that will provide reliable resistance not only to loading but also to deflection. So each one of these can be a very, very thin slab, uh, and we're sort of paying the cost for that with a, a fairly robust set uh, of beams around the edges. The beams provide enough depth that we can eliminate the punching shear problem uh, around the columns. Um, we need some complicated formwork to get both a flat slab and the drop beams. Uh, and we don't really have pans that can take up the size of a whole structural bay. So we're usually building this out of wood, which is reusable, but only up to a point. Right? So the formwork costs uh, are often a little bit, uh, little bit heavier. And uh, we're paying, of course, the price for, for deep beams in terms of uh, integration as well. If we're trying to integrate plumbing or electrical or mechanical, we have to figure out a way either around those beams into the, the voids up here, um, or we have to cast things through them and coordinate with a, with a structural engineer. We can um, uh, sort of supercharge this, hack it a little bit by uh, making a waffle slab, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, here we have very obvious two-way structural action. Loads are getting carried by the joists in both directions, usually to fairly wide girders uh, around the edges. We aim for square bays with this because it's a pure two-way uh, uh, structural system. And we can certainly get more than 30 feet. As we'll see, a waffle slab is one of the best ways to span uh, large distances in two directions. We have a, this waffle slabs, though, the, the price is that these are very, very heavy, especially when we get into big spans. And we have to come up with some way of taking care of the punching shear, often by leaving out some of the domes or some of the formwork uh, and casting a very, very thick flat slab right around the columns uh, or supports. These can be shallower than one-way uh, joist systems, but there is really no good way to get uh, HVAC up into the system. We have to run uh, ductwork, especially down uh, beneath it. We can uh, wrap conduit or cast conduit in place, but plumbing and mechanical really have to go below. So here's our chart for waffle slabs, and you can see that we start at about 32 feet, uh, go up to 48 or, or 54 feet with post-tensioning, again expensive, 
we can increase that out to uh, up to 75 or, or 80 feet. And notice that just like in the pan joists, we have the size of what are called domes. I'll, uh, I'll get, get to that here in just a second. Um, those domes are basically the depth of the void, or if you like, the depth of the, the joists in the waffle slab. And here on the left, you have the total depth. So typically we have uh, a dome size that is four inches less than the total depth. That means we have a four inch slab uh, that is poured on top of the, of the domes. And as you can see, we're very, very efficient. We're um, well into the one to 20 or above uh, span to depth ratio. Notice over here though on the right, we have minimum square column size. And as you can see here, we can put those what are called um, shear panels into waffle slabs, leaving out the formwork so we're casting a very, very deep slab right around the column. But we still need the perimeter of the column and the depth of the slab to give us enough interface, right? Where the two shapes kind of overlap to transfer all of that dead weight through shear uh, into, the, into the columns. So here is a waffle slab dome. Again, these come in standard uh, sizes, standard shapes with standard details. Uh, and they are uh, reusable. We can adjust the size of the joist between them with spacers. Here is a waffle slab in progress. No concrete has been poured yet. And if you look here, fairly familiar example of a waffle slab. If you look closely, you can see these form joints are where the domes, the edges of the domes lined up uh, on the precast panel. Oops, see a slight misalignment there. Um, and then th these four holes are where uh, the domes were actually nailed down to the plywood beneath them. Um, if you get up really close, you can see that uh, they are little indentations that are basically the, the, the fossils of the nail heads uh, that were used to hold the domes in place while the, the slab was being poured. In this case, you can see there is conduit cast into the uh, slab itself that allow them to put uh, lights hanging down from it, but obviously there's no mechanical integration here, a later conduit that had to be put onto the underside of the, um, of the, of the joists. Now, there are systems out there that uh, try to remove some of the dead weight or allow integration. Um, whole deck in particular is one that leaves space, again, around the neutral axis of each joist that allows some fairly large sized pipes or some fairly small uh, ducts uh, to actually get into the system. Um, this is uh, complicated to get the formwork all put together and then remove it after it's all covered in concrete. As you can see, there's a fair amount of reinforcing that goes into this uh, to make it work. If you look closely though, you can see that basically these are just still uh, the same dome formwork uh, as a regular waffle slab, just with some additional panels that, that exclude concrete from these spaces for the, the, the ductwork and pipes. And maybe the, the smartest waffle slab on the planet uh, is at the Kimball Art Museum. Um, this is uh, what a typical waffle slab might look like, right? Basically T-beams set at right angles to one another. Um, in the case of the Kimball, August Commandant, the engineer here uh, for Kahn's building, um, had initially designed a, a solid flat slab uh, and this was what the museum wanted because they wanted the ability to have large sculptural exhibitions. What they hadn't counted on though was taste in sculpture changing. By the late 60s, early 70s, there were a lot of these very heavy, very massive steel sculptures that weighed much more than the initial brief had called for. And so what Commandant did was to do, run the calculations again, but instead of solid concrete, uh, he said, what if we put in giant blocks of styrofoam so we have a very, very thin uh, slab on the base, a couple inches thick. We have a three or four inch slab on the top, like a typical flooring slab. And in between, we just leave the styrofoam uh, in place. We wire it down to the bottom piece of formwork so that it'll uh, float. And what we'll basically have is a very, very deep slab uh, that has uh, almost none of the dead weight of that very deep slab, right? Making it think that it's a very deep slab but doing that with kind of two very, very thin uh, plates on the top and bottom. In other words, instead of a waffle slab that works like a T-beam, this waffle slab works like an I-beam. And Commandant turns to the director, Rick Brown there, and says, we can sum up the weight that we're saving with all of this styrofoam uh, 
uh, and give that to you. And you can put a sculpture that is that heavy uh, on top of this slab. No one ever notices this in the Kimball. They always look at the roof, uh, but underneath your feet when you're walking around uh, gawking at, at, at con spaces, there is also a very, very clever piece uh, of slab engineering. Um, other waffle slabs, of course, Nervi is going to have a go at this. Um, here is uh, a, a tobacco warehouse just outside of Bologna. Uh, very, very cheap building, very, very simple waffle slab. Nervi designs the formwork himself out of this lightweight, uh, what he calls ferro cemento. Um, and because he's designing the domes, he can make them any shape he wants. And he's basically explaining to you that as these joists come into the uh, beams, uh, or girders, uh, the shear value gets higher and higher and higher. And so the joist has to get wider and wider and wider. Not deeper, right? It's not a bending problem. It's just a shear problem. So the joist stays the same depth, but it flares out in plan. And that is basically to accommodate this uh, shear collection as we get close to the beam. As those beams then get close to the columns, uh, the beams flare out vertically. Uh, and this is handling the shear, but it's also telling you that this is a monolithic column that goes over more than one uh, support. So the, the, the bending, the peak moment is not only in the middle, but it's also because it's a hyperstatic beam, that peak moment is repeated, albeit negatively in the column. And so whereas the joists flare out horizontally, no more depth, that takes up shear, the beams flare out vertically, which handles shear uh, and bending. Probably the uh, most expressive uh, waffle slab you can think of. Um, here is a, another one that gets us into the final uh, concrete system that we'll look at. This is a, a, a warehouse that Nervi did a few years later. And you can see it's got a very, very different pattern here. These are those ferro cement pans, but done to a completely different geometry. What's going on here, Nervi, instead of thinking about the slab as a waffle slab, is really thinking about it to begin with as a flat slab. And he's trying to trace the concentrations of stress as they build up, uh, getting closer and closer, not to the beams, but to the columns themselves. And notice that there is both a flat slab around the column and what we call a column cap, right? The column flares out as it approaches the slab. Both of those help with the punching shear. The geometry of the joists themselves is talking about the way that the, the loads of the slab are flowing in two dimensions toward the column. So they're not getting picked up by joists and girders. They are literally flowing through a hyperstatic planar element. And the joists here are kind of mimicking uh, the way that those start to uh, uh, concentrate as they approach the columns above. That is an isotropic system. Right, a, a slab that does not have the structural grain that a corrugated deck or a timber floor or a one-way joist system would have. Right, A pure flat plate system uh, or two-way slab um, is uh, one that does not rely at all on the collection of these loads uh, through beams and, uh, and girders. Instead, we treat the slab as a single plane that is capable of uh, channeling loads, usually not just in two directions, but in an infinite number of directions. And the only thing we have to be careful of is that we find some way to handle that punching shear. So here we have column capitals that you can think of either as the column flaring out to provide more cross section as it goes through the slab, or you can think of it as the slab like dropping down uh, and providing a little bit more section to go with the, 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 um, the perimeter that the, the column offers. Um, flat formwork, so easy to build. We've just got to make the little cutouts for the for the um, the drop the drop uh, columns or the the, mush, the column caps, um, and the depth of it itself is very thin, uh, much thinner than a one-way joist. But this system is really really heavy uh, and requires an awful lot not only of um, uh, section here, but also usually a lot of steel reinforcement to handle the the shear. Um, and here you see a, a kind of topographical map of the stress concentrations. And in particular, you see that we have very, very low shear, obviously, in the middle. But if you think about it, very, very high bending, right? Bending and shear are always going to happen in, in, in opposite places. And the, the shear really gets concentrated as all of that load is getting collected by the slab itself uh, near, the, near the columns. <clears throat> 
To deal with that, uh, we usually do either drop panels that you see here, thickening the slab near the columns, uh, or again here, a, a typical mushroom cap from the early 20th century, where the, the column, instead of uh, being a cylinder that gets wider, becomes a cone. And that gives the engineers room to get a huge quantity of rebar from the slab, turning the corner kind of gently down into the, into the column. Um, the other way we can do this is by just increasing the amount of rebar itself. And so here, uh, a typical uh, drawing of rebar from an early mushroom cap system. And you can see that basically they have tried to make uh, the, the rebar run in as many directions as they can, right? So the slab itself is isotropic, no structural grain. The rebar pattern here is quasi-isotropic, right? They're trying to get uh, one, two, three, four different directions of, of rebar and overlay those as they approach the, the column capitals. Um, Swiss engineer uh, Robert Maillard uh, did that one better, this very, very elegant system of rebar where he basically just increases the thickness of the rebar as it approaches the column. So instead of all of these complicated patterns, um, you just have to keep track of what uh, flavor rebar the, the uh, iron workers are putting down on top of the formwork. The, the iron or steel gets thicker and thicker and thicker as you get closer and closer to the column, but you're keeping a fairly simple uh, grid uh, that, that's easier to, to put together uh, on the job site. Okay, in the next uh, video, we'll flip this around. Uh, and instead of looking at slabs that collect uh, the, uh, the, the, the loads from the floor, we'll look at slabs that actually distribute those loads out over uh, a stratum of soil. We'll look at uh, why those principles are similar. We're going from a, a point load column to a, a, a distributed load uh, over a, a, a inverted slab, so just the opposite process of, of column design. And we'll look at what happens within the ground uh, that we can use to help us. Also, uh, why foundations go wrong, right? Things that, that we have to look out for uh, in buildings that are both uh, small scale houses, frame buildings, uh, and also things like uh, skyscrapers. In the last video, we'll look at foundation types. Uh, we'll do some very, very quick calculations to show how uh, soil mechanics contributes to the stability of buildings.